Using a computer simulation to train for air combat is not something new for modern air forces. In the last video in this series, I went over how the U.S. Air Force did it using custom-built sim systems like this. Twenty years ago, these kind of simulators were out of reach of an ordinary person's budget. But today, it's possible to recreate that experience using a desktop PC. That's exactly what I did, and I'm going to share my work on this project for free so everyone can try it on their own. Do you want to know how it works and how you can get it? Then keep watching. In this video, I went over how a U.S. Air Force combat simulator was used to make fighter pilots better at beyond visual range combat, which we'll just abbreviate to BVR. The core of the Air Force's sim was made up of two parts, a scenario that was flown by the participants before and after training, and the special software that measured critical details for each of these benchmark scenarios. With both of these pieces working together, the progress of the participants could be accurately measured. So they could get a good idea of how the pilots performed on day one, and then again after a week of training to gauge how much improvement had occurred. And as it turned out, it was a lot. Being able to see the specific areas that could be better is the core of learning. So is the ability to track your progress. That's what made this particular sim so beneficial. I wanted to bring this same experience to the public. That's why I built this scenario on top of the commercially available sim DCS. The core of DCS is free. Now, technically, to use the same jet as the USAF scenario, you do need a module that costs money. But DCS has a program to trial the jet for two weeks. So for a two-week period, you can do this mission completely free. Now let's take a look at the first part of our recreation, the scenario. The original scenario used by the Air Force looked like this. Four human pilots in four F-16 simulators would be tasked with defending a ground asset. These pilots would be supported by a separate crew in an AWACS simulator, whose job it would be to enhance the fighter flight's situational awareness. On the enemy side were two Sukhoi-24 fencers with the goal of bombing the ground asset. These two fencers would be protected by six Sukhoi-27 flankers. In other words, the blue team was outnumbered 2-1 to one by the red team. But that wasn't enough of a challenge in the eyes of the Air Force, so they added in another obstacle. The AWACS crew was told to not report on hostile contacts flying at low altitude to simulate the effects of ground clutter and the radar horizon. I go into greater detail on these effects in my series on radar. The two fencers are programmed to fly into the target below this altitude. So in addition to fighting the six escort aircraft, the defending F-16s would have to search for the fencers using their own radars. The scenario I created uses an AI-controlled AWACS, so there isn't an option to tell them to ignore low flyers. Instead, the AWACS is set to orbit beyond a mountain range which will block out radar returns from low-altitude targets. With the defenders outnumbered and low flyers hidden from long-range radar, it's not a stretch to say this is a difficult scenario. Every minute counts here. Those fencers can fly at Mach 1 at sea level, which is about 11 nautical miles per minute. That doesn't leave much time for the defenders to get things right. Every minute wasted brings the attackers 11 miles closer to victory. So communication and coordination need to be as close to perfect as possible. That's the real lesson to be learned here. Because this is such a demanding scenario, I added something which wasn't present in the original Air Force sim. A difficulty selector. In my mission, you can choose from six difficulty levels when you start. Level six will be the full experience of the Air Force mission. As you decrease the level, you decrease the number of flanker escorts. So level five has five escorts, and level one has only one. Since levels one through four are meant to help newer pilots work their way up to the Air Force level of difficulty, they have a couple extra helpful features. One is the addition of a second AWACS aircraft which is closer to the fight. This one does not have a mountain in the way. So as a pilot, you will receive targeting data for everything, even low-flying aircraft. But once you make the leap from level 4 to level 5, that closer AWACS goes away. Then your AWACS won't see low-flying aircraft. One other thing changes with the mission. In levels 1 through 4, the red aircraft will always spawn from the same handful of locations. From level 5 upwards, their starting locations will be randomized. So you might end up with two enemy flights coming in together from the northwest, or from different directions spread evenly around the battle area. It'll be up to you to quickly come up with a plan to deal with them either way. For this scenario, the ground asset is marked as bullseye in the jet system. 
I go over what bullseye is in this video. That spot also happens to be this distinctively shaped lake, which should make it easy to spot with your eyes. This is also where all human controlled fighters need to be before the mission will start. So if you see this error message, then it means someone is too far from bullseye to begin. That's the scenario part of the mission. Now let's talk about the other crucial part, how it tracks your performance. Great scenarios are important, but they don't mean anything if you have no way of knowing how you did, or if you did better than last time. This can be tricky in BVR since the key metrics to watch are things like how far away a target was when it got hit by your missile, or how fast you were going at time of launch. When you're trying to survive an incoming enemy missile, it can be tricky to find time to track those things by hand. So that's why this mission has code running behind the scenes to do all that for you. And it's all automatic once you start the scenario. You begin the mission by opening up the radio menu, selecting Other, then choosing the difficulty level. When you're done with the mission, you'll go into the menu and select End Scenario. The software will send you a message saying the data has been exported to a file in the Save Games folder for DCS. This is where all your progress is saved, and we'll be using it to view how you did in the mission. And in case you're wondering, the name of the file is just the date and time that it was created represented as one big number. So let's take a look at what gets written into this file. At first glance, it might look like gibberish, but it's written this way to make it easy to import into an application made for displaying data. You can use something like Google Sheets for free and import it like this. When it's done importing, it should be a lot easier to read. Let's go over what all this means. Each of these rows will be some sort of event along with its statistics. This column shows the type of event. Every missile shot by the human team will be marked with the word shot. The same goes with hits from the human team. None of these shots and hits will be from the AI, so it's just the data for you and your team. As we move across the page, we'll see some more data about shots. This is the speed of the aircraft at launch, along with its pitch angle and altitude. Remember, these stats affect missile performance, and I cover those in more detail in these videos. Next, we have some target data. This is the target's altitude and how far away it is in nautical miles from the launching aircraft. Out here is the name of the target. Over time, we'd like to see the target range go up. This is a special field that tracks if there is a clear avenue of fire, or CAF for short. Clear Avenue of Fire means that a friendly aircraft was not inside a narrow cone in front of the launching aircraft when a missile was fired. If there is a friendly aircraft there, then that was a Clear Avenue of Fire violation, which puts the friend in danger of getting hit. Whenever there's a CAF violation, there will be a 1 in this column. 0 means no violation. We also have this F-pole field here, which is only filled in for hits. When an enemy aircraft is hit, then an imaginary pole is drawn between shooter and target, and its length in nautical miles is saved here. Like target range, we want to see F-pole go up as skill improves. Down below all our shots and hits, we have these four MAR events. That stands for minimum abort range, and it's something I explained in this video. But to summarize, it's the range at which a pilot has the last opportunity to turn while remaining outside an enemy's weapon range. Each human-controlled fighter will get an entry here showing how long they spent inside of MAR in seconds. This is tied to the aircraft tail number you can see here. Now technically you're inside of MAR while making that last minute turn, so it's possible to be inside MAR and not in the actual weapon employment zone. I wanted to track time in that stern weapon engagement zone separately, and that's shown here in the next column. Ideally, you want to get this number as close to zero as possible. Now the very last line is an important one. This is the equivalent of the real world scenario's Top Gun summary score. In fact, it uses the same exact scoring system as I covered in this video on the real life project this is based on. And just like that one, we have the final score here in this column. The rest of the columns are just a breakdown of that summary score. 
This is the total number of strike aircraft shot down before reaching the target. And this is the number shot down after reaching the target. It's important to differentiate because we want to stop these aircraft before they can bomb the thing we're defending. Kills in this column are worth three times as much as the ones in this column. So make sure you get them all here. Next is the number of enemy escorts shot down. Fratricides are the number of humans hit by friendly fire. Obviously this should be zero. Next is friendly losses from any cause other than fratricide. These last three columns aren't actually part of the score but are there for your benefit. This is the closest that AI strikers came to the target in nautical miles. As you improve, this should go up. Lastly, we have the proportion of hits from blue and red missiles. A 1 here means a 100% hit rate. 0.54 means 54% of shots hit. As you get better, the blue proportion should rise while the red one sinks. Now it's great to have all this data, but you need to do something with it to make it useful. And this is the part where I can't write logic that'll do the work for you. That's something that you need to do as a debrief. After each scenario, you should have a discussion with your team about each phase of the engagement. Ask questions about anything that sticks out. Could these launch parameters have been better? Do any target ranges stick out as being much shorter than the rest? Did someone spend far more time in MAR than the rest of the team? Always look for ways to improve each metric. It's also very helpful to have a visualization tool like TACView, which is a free download and it can help you jog your memory about different phases of the battle. Once you've gone over the entire engagement, you should have a to-do list of things that could be improved next time. Then you just repeat the steps. Your score should improve if you follow this process. And this is exactly what the US Air Force does in the real world. This is followed by a briefing, flying the mission, and then a debrief before going right back to the beginning for the next iteration. Follow this cycle and you too will improve. I'll leave a link to the mission file below. So go ahead and give it a shot, then let me know if it's helped you. It's helped me tremendously, and I think you'll see similar results. And as always, thanks for watching.